We are at the point where Reno has crossed the little bighorn at Ford A, reformed his command, and with the scouts to the left and right, is galloping toward the village, chasing after a small group of Indians. Custer, with five companies, is advancing on the east bank. Benteen has finished his scout and is nearing the confluence of No Name Creek and Reno Creek, and the pack train is about a mile east of Benteen. Downstream from Reno, the village extends from the area north of the present-day and abandoned Gary Owen store to the mouth of Medicine Tail Cooley. Per the usual setup, the Hunk Papa under Sitting Bull was at one end and the Cheyenne at the other. How many natives occupied this ground? Of course, estimates are all over the place, but let's start with the fact that George Crook faced about 1,000 warriors only eight days prior at the Battle of the Rosebud. The idea that the number of warriors tripled or quadrupled in just eight days does not seem possible. So for the sake of argument, let's use the estimate of Dr. Richard Fox that there were no more than 2,000 warriors and 6,000 people in total. By the way, the organization, Friends of the Little Bighorn, has scoured numerous sources and identified the names of 941 warriors. It was a typical day in the village after a long night of festivities. Some of the pony herd was on the bench lands to the west. Some women were out gathering wild turnips. Some men were out hunting. And many people were swimming and bathing in the river on the hot, dry, nearly windless day. The story of White Bull is typical. He was a nephew of Sitting Bull, and he watered his 20 horses that morning. 20 horses made him a wealthy man in the village. Then took them out to graze. Going back to camp, he ate his fill and was getting ready for the day. Ended up heading out, uh, back out to herd his horses to the river for their midday watering. To his surprise, he heard someone yelling that some soldiers were approaching. Reno thundered across the valley. In general, following the course of the river with companies G, A, and M, he also ordered Captain French to put a detachment of 10 to 15 men on the far right to protect that flank. Varnum, who was with the scouts on the left, stated that as they advanced, the warriors were coming out of the village and riding back and forth to create a cloud of dust to obscure the village. Reno, with only some 160 men, including scouts and interpreters, upon seeing the number of Indians facing his command, concluded that he had bitten off more than his charge could chew and thus ordered the command to dismount and fight on foot. It is important to point out that after I published the video on the tour of the Reno Valley fight several months ago, I received several personal messages describing how and where the fighting evolved. In general, Reno orders the command to dismount and form a skirmish line. Okay, The M Company detachment on the right flank moves into the timber to maintain security, while Captain French moves the rest of the company to the left of the line. Company A dismounts, moves into a skirmish line, and ends up switching places with G Company, which now anchors the right. There are several scenarios of where the Reno fight happened. It seems that much of the best option depends on where the river flowed in 1876. From this shot, we can see what is known as the Gary Owen Bend, which is now what is known as an Oxbow Lake. We actually have a recent example of two oxbow lakes forming near the Reno crossing site. Here is the topographical map with the course of the river in 1980. And here is the satellite photo of that same area from 2016. If you have studied physical geography, you will know that when an oxbow lake is created, it will no longer become part of the natural river flow unless, of course, from human intervention. If the Gary Owen Loop, 
was the active channel in 1877, as claimed. It was the active channel in 1876, period. Also, flooding actually speeds up the process of a meander becoming an oxbow lake. It doesn't reverse it. If we overlay what I believe is the best approximation of the river's course in 1876, then the geographical and archaeological evidence supports what I refer to as the Dr. Scott line. If the river followed a different course, then other scenarios have some validity. As the command deployed into a skirmish line and began firing, Varnum claimed he saw E Company, the Grey Horse Company, moving on the bluffs across the river. More on the Custer sightings in a little bit. In the village, White Bull drove his ponies to the Mini Kanju camp, and after seeing his family to safety, rode to the Hunk Papa camp where he witnessed Sitting Bull exhorting the warriors to fight. As he did so, bullets from the soldiers began hitting the area. Indian accounts point out that several people in the village were wounded and killed by this long-range fire. The Sioux woman moving robe had been out digging for turnips and had run back to the village on the soldiers' approach. There she heard the news that her younger brother Deeds had been killed. As she prepared for the battle and revenge, she noticed soldiers across the river on the bluffs. Please note that the distances the natives and some of Reno's men in the valley, including Lieutenants Varnum and DeRudio, spotted the Custer Battalion on the bluffs were over one mile. I was very skeptical of these sightings, especially DeRudio's claim of seeing Custer on the bluff, until I remembered something I saw while on the battlefield last September. While at the Weir Point turnoff, I noticed a group of horses at the Medicine Tail Coulee turnoff, and I drove down to the point in the hope of counting coup on one of them. Here they are. And of course, I was not able to count coup. However, the distance from one turnoff to the other is 1.43 miles. So it seems these sightings are all plausible. Reno became aware of the threat coming from the timber to the lead horses, and he moved there with the balance of the men from Company G, leaving Lieutenant Benny Hodgson to advise him what was happening on the skirmish line. It may have been a good idea to temporarily conduct a personal recon of the timber area, but Reno stayed in the timber and lost both situational awareness and control of the skirmish line. With most of Company G in the woods, the skirmish line began to drift to the timber, and as the Sioux began to turn the left flank, M Company began to pivot to protect it. Plus, it seems that fire discipline was lacking on the skirmish line. Captain Moylan stated he had to send men off the line to secure more ammo from the horses. Recall that a trooper carried 50 rounds of carbine ammunition on his person. As the command fell back, Sergeant Miles O'Hara of M Company was killed and his body was abandoned. As the fighting continued around the timber area, Reno was asking himself where Custer was. He had not followed in support, but had been seen across the river. So where was he? Reno did not believe the timber was defensible for much longer as he was almost surrounded. Therefore, we come to the point where we have to ask ourselves, could the timber have been held? You will probably hate this answer, but maybe. It seems to succeed that the movement from the skirmish line into the timber would have to have been better controlled. Some fire discipline established, a small reserve force created, and probably more importantly, a resolute commander in place. Reno was an experienced cavalry officer, but he was no hell more. At any rate, Reno did not think he could hold the timber, and most of the officers of the 7th concurred at the Reno Court of Inquiry in 1879. Reno, believing his position was untenable, ordered the command to mount up for what he would later characterize as a charge. However, with his command scattered around the timber, many men, mainly from G Company, never got that order. Those that did had to scramble for their horses, of course, now most of the firing line had evaporated. 
This defensive collapse coincided with a renewed surge by the Sioux as Crazy Horse arrived at the timber area. His arrival fired up the warriors, and many pressed into the timber at the very time Reno's command became unglued. As the Sioux approached and fired, a round slammed into the head of Bloody Knife, killing him and splattering Reno with blood and brains. Probably a bit rattled, Reno thus ordered the soldiers to dismount, then ordered them to remount, and this only added to the confusion. And with Reno hollering some sort of command, he led the galloping troopers, at least those that heard him, out of the timber. The Cheyenne Wooden Leg had halted just south of the timber when all of a sudden he saw Reno's men galloping directly at him. Believing the soldiers were attacking, he whipped his horse and decided to make good his escape. But when he turned around, he saw the soldiers were fleeing to the river. In a flash, Wooden Leg went from hunted to hunter. Reno's so-called charge was turning into what many natives would later describe as a buffalo hunt. It is not so much Reno's decision to leave the timber, but how he left it, in a hurry and in utter chaos. Herded to the east, Reno's battalion galloped and fought their way to a ford to the east, across the river, and up the steep bluffs. The Sioux killed two Arikara during the retreat, one of them their leader, Bob Tail Bull. Lieutenant Hodgson was mortally wounded crossing the river, and you can see his marker in this photo. When Dr. Porter reached the top of the bluffs, he saw Reno walking around excitedly with a red bandana wrapped around his head, and Porter said to him, Major, the men were pretty well demoralized, weren't they? Reno shot back. That was a charge, sir. Well, that charge had cost Reno 41 casualties, including Lieutenants McIntosh and Hodgson. Meanwhile, to the north of Reno's disorganized mob, a nephew of the Oglala chief Red Cloud, his name was Shortbull, engaged Crazy Horse as he rode up to him and stated, Too late, you missed the fight. He heard Crazy Horse say as he pointed to the north at a mass of cavalry. That was Custer's column. Sorry to miss the fight, but there is a good fight coming over the hill. And with that, Crazy Horse and his followers begin to descend the bluffs back towards the river with Short Bull in tow. The fight had only just begun. Mm -hmm. 